Can I ask everyone to take their seats so that we can get started? And again, all the people at the back, come forward, come forward. We're very, very nice, and so we won't do anything horrible to you. You can ignore the seat numbers. Somebody last week told me that instead of getting people who've been marginalized invited to the table, we should either redesign or just break the table. So ignore this numbers on your seats. <laughs> Move forward. Okay. So, good morning from Lily and myself. <laughs> this is the final morning of the dialogue, and there have been a couple of slight amendments, but we think that this will really um, enrich our discussions. So, this morning, we have added to the program as it was. What we will have now is a one-hour discussion with some millennial youth leaders. Exactly, yay! <laughs> um, who are all here. And Jim, of course, is a millennial. No. <laughs> Um, so we will have that discussion until 10 o'clock, maybe just after 10. We will then have a 10-minute break for people to get up and move and do whatever they need to do. And then the millennial leaders will um, go down into the audience, with the exception of Donald and millennial Jimpa. Um, and, and the presenters will come back up and we'll have a presentation by, I'm gonna, uh, she has, luckily she's not here yet, so she can't hear me destroy her name, by Pumla Gobodo Madikazela, who, <laughs> who's going to be doing a presentation looking at Ubuntu and forgiveness. Really, really exciting. Um, after that, we will have the discussion on stage with um, uh, Pumla, and we will start to begin to draw all of the threads of our discussion over the past two days together. We will finish a little later than we normally finish. We will finish at 12 o'clock, and at 12 o'clock, there'll be a one-hour break for lunch. I'm reminding myself. After the one-hour break for lunch, we have got, at one o'clock, we have got such a fantastic treat because Vuzi Mahalesa, Mah, I can never pronounce that, Mahasela is going to be performing um, for a whole hour for us. It's the most wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, and then we will call the proceedings to a halt. Sure. Yeah, okay. okay. So, before we start this morning, I'm gonna make you all stand up again. Ooh. It's very good for you to stand up and sit down. You're working your muscles. But what I would like us all to do, just before we go into this really exciting panel, is just to take a moment, okay? Each of you, just take a moment. And I would like you all to, first of all, close your eyes, Ground yourself in your own body, knowing that we're here at this wonderful Botho University. We are here in Habron. We are here in Botswana. We are here in Africa. We are rooted. And then take your hands and just touch your forehead and open your mind. Open your mind to possibilities, to opportunities, and to learning. And then touch your lips, and remember that words can bring us together, but they can also tear us apart. And we link our mind, our lips, and our hearts, so touch your hearts, together to ensure that this morning will be a morning of learning, of caring, of sharing, and then of moving forward with action and with intent to make our lives and this world better. So now stretch your hands up to the sky, open your eyes, look up, 
be ready to go. Let's start. <laughs> this. Thank you very much, Theo, for that enlivening introduction. So my task is very simple. I just have to introduce Donald to you. Donald is an actor writer, and today he's going to talk to us about Boto as a basis for intergenerational dialogue. And obviously, it has already been explained why that is important. But I also wanted to remind those of us who are of Sotswana origin that we have the saying, it is in recognition of the fact that an adult can be completely wise unless they sometimes listen to the young around them. So with that, I hand over to Donald. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to Botswana. I am going to talk to you about my work and about the role of Bhutto in my work and hopefully shed light on larger Bhutto issues. Um, I sit before you as one person, but I speak as many. I speak on behalf of my dear grandmother, who turned 95 years old yesterday. I also speak on behalf of millions of Botswana youth who desire to be part of this discourse on Botho, but do not have the 10 US dollars to be in this room. Bantumile, they have requested me to speak on behalf of them as well. I also speak on behalf of myself, and it's a tremendous honor for me to present to you ways in which Botho forms the basis of my work as an African actor and writer working with African stories. In my work in stage, on stage and in film, colonial education in Africa is, is implicitly and explicitly interrogated, and suggestions are subsequently made about what can be done to finally anchor our education system and its content on Boto. I was fortunate to get an early start in my profession, but it was not until my formal actor training in drama school in England, that I truly appreciated the power of theater to underscore or subvert our shared humanity. It was in drama school that I realized that the texts that were being used to teach me dramatic technique were steeped exclusively in European history and often lacked characters who look like myself. I suggest here that by ritually reenacting the stories of those who came before, the European was doing botho to their ancestors. Uh, someone stapled this wrong, so I'm gonna... It's okay. Um, and although I understand that all humanity is one, the question that I asked myself at the time was, how do I as an African create work that humanizes my own ancestors? I discovered that theater and performance can function as a carrier of memory, an archive, and also to safeguard the past for coming generations. As a result uh, of these experiences, my work concerns itself with two elements. One, to tell the stories of Africa and Africans where their humanity is fully present. Two, to put the past in dialogue with the present in an African context to heal the trauma of colonialism. Now I'll just, thank you. I'll just go into uh, really concrete examples of how this plays out in my work. In 2002, I had the honor of being invited as a child delegate to represent Botswana at the historic United Nations General Assembly special session on children. A very long title. Uh, and uh, it was convened by, and mentored by the late Nelson Mandela and Grasa Michelle uh, at uh, the UN headquarters in New York. Over the course of the special session, child delegates from all over the world engaged world leaders in intergenerational dialogue. The dialogue took many forms, and in my case, I used theater to communicate to world leaders my personal grievances about African curricula in Africa. At the end of the special session, now it's time for that page. <laughs> At the end of the special session, all of us child delegates 
had committed all our governments to immediately sign a time-bound set of specific goals for children and young people, a document that we called a World Fit for Children. A World Fit for Children was immediately adopted and is now in force globally, protecting the rights of children to have the best possible start in life. For instance, in Kenya, a World Fit for Children catalyzed the government, the Kenyan government's pledge to provide free primary education a year later in 2003. It is accurate to say that a world fit for children has been impactful because our elders did boto to us by inviting us to the table of decision making. That is the high level of engagement in intergenerational dialogue that the young people of Africa and the world seek and deeply desire. It is also accurate to say that a world fit for children continues to make globe, a global mark because the intervention was consistently intergenerational. I believe that is an example of what Bhutto does when it translates into action. I'm a Botswana raised in Botswana, Botswana of the 1990s, and that means I grew up with Bhutto as a practical concept. Since Bhutto was already officially one of our national values, uh, and it was adopted before I was born, Growing up in Botswana also meant that I had practical examples of Bhutto in action. It was not just a philosophy, or worse, a commodity. For example, in 1966, when Botswana became independent, when Botswana was formed, really, uh, we were the only country in the world that had a symbol uh, in their national emblem of racial harmony our flag, one large stripe for the black majority, two smaller white stripes for the white citizens, and the neighbors with whom we want to live in harmony. And it just so happens. Oh. <laughs> it makes me proud as a Mutswana to say that my home country was formed in consonant with the tenets of Boto. In 1976, my grandfather's generation of Botswana donated cows, goats, grains to build our first university. They wanted to do Boto to generations that they will never see. In 1976 still, when Botswana had no national university but desired one, four schoolgirls of Swaneng Hill School in Seroe died in a car accident on their way to Lady Kama Center, where they had where they were going to volunteer to help fundraise for the university. Their names and ages were Sarah Ohaketsi Matware, 16, Magdalene Pirinyane, 15, Elizabeth Masake, 16, and Maitume Lotari, 14. I speak their names to honor them. Oh. Such stories run through my work as examples of how Boto is practiced and indeed contested in modern Botswana. To excavate these stories, since colonialism attempted to destroy them, is to encounter the wisdom of our elders, and my mentor through that process was Sir Kitumile Masire, the man who in 1980, during his term as president of Botswana, ensured that Botswana officially crowned Boto as our national value. In our intergenerational conversations, and interactions. So Kitumile Masire challenged me to reimagine how to re-implement interdependence in today's Botswana. The result was my book called We Are All Blue, blue as the national color, and in the flag representing water, a prized commodity in Botswana. Uh, the result was a book uh, of plays or dramatic literature uh, that spoke about humanity's interconnectedness through our own history. As my elder, Seki Tumile wrote the foreword for the book. That, for me, is another example of Boto in action. And I would also like to point out that such works about Botswana, or Botswana history, where Botswana is at the center of their story, are not taught in Botswana schools because we insist on keeping in place the colonized curriculum that we inherited from the past. So unfortunately, 
even with the blessings of my elders, I know that the stories contained in We Are All Blue will not come anywhere close to being taught in my own country in my lifetime. Because we, Botswana, remain still a deeply colonized people who extend both to everyone else but ourselves, everyone else's story but ours. That needs to change, that must change. <laughs> Often in Botswana's discourse of Boto, young people are at best excluded and at worst discussed as a problem. But if they are the future and Boto can only survive through them, why not actively engage them in dialogue? That gesture, after all, is Boto itself. I'll just now talk about my upcoming projects, which I think shed light on um, the issues I spoke about before. So my next book, called Dear Upright African, is a love letter to the young Af people of Africa to show them that they come from a people with a rich history that adds value to the total human experience. Dear Upright African is also a call to action for my generation of Africans to take history into our hands and work towards reincorporating Boto into the African classroom to align our education systems with our core values. To finally decolonize our African curricula and teach in schools the dreams and realities of our African ancestors. Boto tells us to be upright in our pursuit of healing from colonial trauma. I fundamentally believe the proverb that says, if you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. With that in mind, for Dear Upright African, I chose to be under the mentorship of my elder from Zimbabwe, Titi Dangaremka, and my elder from Kenya, Binya Vanga Wainaina, who are two of Africa's leading writers. But to in action, is by definition intergenerational. And now that I have seen how this approach enriches my work, I only do my acting and writing projects in alignment with Boto, so that I may offer gratitude to those who came before myself. It was, after all, at the suggestion of my elders that today, based on our quota system of democratic village court, I convene many Botswana young Botswana and Africans in a digital quota on social media platforms where we address present African youth challenges in the democratic fashion of our ancestors. Okay. Because of the prayers of my 95-year-old grandmother and the blessings of countless elders, I have been able to do important work, but I want to point out as I'm closing that I am not an anomaly. Many African young people in this room are doing important work, and before I conclude, I would just like to speak about one example, if I may. Okay. <laughs> Doctor, Doctor, okay. Doctor Didi Bion, a Mutsuana psych psychologist, <coughs> clinical psychologist, and Mother K. Masire, is a mindful coach, mindfulness coach. Together, they are using their abilities to resuscitate Boto. Their organization runs on the fundamental belief that human intelligence is incomplete without Boto. To that end, Afro Boto offers the framework towards a Boto quotient instead of intelligence quotient because there's no full human intelligence without Boto. Thank you so much, and I look forward to talking to you. Thank you so much, Donald. And actually, you've made my job very easy because you've introduced the, the next session. Because as you said, there are many amazing young people already involved. And we have got four of them on stage with us. So um, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves as they contribute to the discussion, and then we'll come back for a more general discussion. So actually, I'm going to go straight along and start with Justine. Just to say to you, two 
um, that two of them, Justine and Landa, are Mandela Washington Fellows, which is an amazing tribute. They've been chosen out of hundreds of thousands of people on our continent. And then we have Augustine and Leonard, who up uh, the other way around, Leonard and Augustine, <laughs> <laughs> um, who are Dalai Lama Fellows. So these are four really amazing young leaders. So Justine. Um, a very good morning to everyone here. Um, my name is Justine Hamupolo. I'm from Namibia. And as uh, Meme rightfully mentioned, I am a 2017 Mandela Washington Fellow. I've been privileged to be chosen out of 64,000 uh, youth who have applied and only 1,000 managed to, to, to get through to, to be part of the fellowship. Um, I am a young person, a young woman, and I like to say politically, I am, you know, an advocate for the youth. Um, back home in my country, I work with young people, young women, and I work with the LGBTI community. I work around sensitizing the local communities around the issues of the LGBTI people, around the issues of young people, um, but I also work within the LGBTI community to make them understand what are the human rights that we're talking about? What is humanity um, that we keep throwing left, right, and center? Um, and so working with young people, I'm also privileged that I was then chosen to be one of the people that can sit on high level um, um, platforms where I sit on the technical working group of young people and the key populations in our country. So I am basically the face and the voice of the grassroots level people. I'm also in the process of setting up an organization with a few of my colleagues that aims to work with persons who identify within and beyond their sex, their gender, their sexual orientation, gender identity expression, um, and sexual characteristics. Um, and for me, when I'm part of this conversation and listening the past two days and also <coughs> listening to my brother right now, I like to say that I'm privileged. I'm privileged to be sitting here. I'm privileged to be part of the conversations because so many a times we do work and we do not put things into perspective. We talk about inclusivity, but when we go back to the basis of what inclusivity is, we talk about Ubuntu, mm -hmm. and Ubuntu is that for me. Mm -hmm. Ubuntu is when we are able to look at one another as human beings and take away the layers. Before a person is a lesbian, they are a woman. Before they are a woman, they are a human being. And how do we then work with each other and work beyond that? Um, Donald spoke about um, the privilege he had of being part of a platform where he was included to make a decision and therefore impact on many more young people's lives. And I say that is the way we need to go. We need to talk about inclusivity in all levels. In saying as we are seated here, we are young people. But when we do design as young people um, programs and activities, do we only design to have young people part of it at the mm. end or towards the end of our conversations? Or do we think of, let's include everyone while we are designing, mm. while we are piloting, while we are implementing, so that we can talk about ownership? Because mm. we can talk about Ubuntu, and we can talk about it as a thing of it being there. But the moment we include everyone, there's a sense of ownership. The question was yesterday, um, how do we move? How do we implement? How do we make it practical? And the key word for me is ownership, and ownership is only through inclusivity. We talk about something as simple as our flags. When we are in schools, we are taught about our flags. And our flags normally represent a message in it, a message that talks about the ocean, that talks about the blood that was wavered, you know, all of that, all our flags talks about that. And we ask ourselves, where are the African flags? Where are the global flags on this stage? 
to just represent that Ubuntu as one. Um, I think I will leave it at that for now <laughs> while we continue with the conversation. Thank you so much, Justine. Okay, so we're going to move on to Landa. Guys, please ignore that clock because it's wrong. Yeah. So, but you know what you're doing, so it's fine. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Theo. Uh, Dumelang, everyone. Dumelang. In my native tongue, we'd say Molweni. That's closer. Molweni. Molweni. <laughs> thank you for seeing me. Um, thank you for acknowledging me. My name is Landa Mabenga. I come from a small little place in South Africa called Ngambedlana in Umtata, but I am based in Cape Town. <laughs> I present before you today as a human first. I present to you as a friend, as someone's son, as someone's brother, as someone's uncle, but mostly as a human being, as a person. I also present as a 2017 Mandela Washington Fellow. It is the work that I do that sees me here today. What is the work that I do? I have a consulting company that links transgender youth in South Africa to care. This company also creates education and awareness around transgender issues, not issues, realities. Uh, why do I do this work? I do this work because the transgender story is my story. I was born in a body that was not aligned to the core of who I am. So I was born transgender. And I spent a lot of years, a lot of time, fighting the core of who I was. I rebelled against the essence of who I was, and it took conversations with my grandparents, with my family, to tell me, you need to make peace with yourself and you need to allow yourself to be who you are. So that is why it was important for me to engage in this work and to do the work that I do. And for me, that immediately showed me the beauty of access, the beauty of peace, <coughs> the beauty of justice, where in a home setting, on a home level, you can have these human conversations that allow you to present as who you are so that you can merge within a society that is able to serve others who do not have that access, who do not have that privilege, who do not have that justice. So how does this link to humanity? How does this link to Ubuntu? It was the Dalai Lama's book called The Art of Happiness, which liberated me to a great deal. And there's a quote in there that says, right now, at this moment, I have a mind which is all the equipment I need to be happy. Mm. Now that is where Ubuntu for me starts. It starts with finding happiness within yourself so that you may be able to merge that with another's happiness. And so the continuum continues. Again, <clears throat> I realized that more than anything else, my biggest fear was fear itself. There's nothing to fear but fear. The minute I could let go of that fear, I started to listen to my life. Someone asked a question about listening yesterday. How do you listen to your heart? You take moments with yourself, <coughs> you be still, you quiet your mind, and you align yourself to the core of who you are. When you wake up in the morning, you speak to your God. You speak to your ancestors. I still wake up and speak to my grandparents up until today because I might not see them, but they are, all, they are around me all the time. That is a linkage to humanity because there's a very big, long thread that connects us as human beings and there's the circle of life mm. that we need to understand and align with that circle so that we can understand and quantify Ubuntu holistically. In closing, um, there's a quote that I found somewhere. I think it's, it's by the actress Emma Stone. She says, there is no greater representation of beauty than someone who is unafraid to be herself. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Landa. And then we're going to move on to our two Dalai Lama fellows. And we'll start with the right name this time, Leonard. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hi everyone, and I'm excited to be here. My name is Leonard, I'm from Ghana, and I'm a Dalai Lama Fellow. 
Um, I'm sure you guys are wondering who is a Dalai Lama Fellow. Basically, we are all over the world and we engage in projects um, using values such as Boto, Ubuntu, in our daily lives. And one story I can share with you using that practice is whilst um, doing my community service project in Ghana, I encountered a young female who was in school, and one thing she said was, in a, in a discussion we had, I asked her, what do you want to become when you grow up? And she said, I wanted to become a doctor. And I asked her, how do you think it's <coughs> possible? And even at the age of seven, she said, only if my mother and my father would actually take me to school, and uh, sorry, allow me to come to school, then take me to the farm, then I can achieve my dreams. This story moved me so much, and I realized that the problem of forgetting a lot of people's dreams is actually the parents, and it's a place we've not paid a lot of attention to. And my project was in adult literacy, where I educated um, adults and taught them how to read and write to the point where they couldn't write from the beginning, from the point where they couldn't write their names to the point where they could write letters to people in the United States. And during this time, I had a lot of challenges. Um, one other challenge that I shared, just, I shared was electing a class leader for our project. During this time, one lady you know, nominated herself, <laughs> and everyone said, no, we can have a lady lead us, and these are the men in the community. And we put a, we put a hold on it. We developed a curriculum based on some of the teachings we, we got from the Dalai Lama. Uh, fellows, um, assembly, and after six months of dialogue, we were able to elect a class representative, which was a lady. And they respected her, they gave her a lot of um, regard, and she was able to take the class to the end of the project. In my opinion, when we look at both Ubuntu and say, I am because you are, my question is, who is the I? I think that I is not defined very well, because as an African, what is my story? What is my identity? The identity of an African cannot be defined, in my <coughs> opinion. Who is a Ghanaian? Who is a Kenyan? And I think we need, to start, we need to start by defining who the I is. Define who you are. And I have been able to do this by creating my own world. And I, I put out a lot of young people to say, what kind of world do you want to create? The kind of world I am creating, I'm working to create, is a world where every young person, irrelevant of your background, your race, your sex, has equal opportunities to education, and they can, and which can help them to achieve their dreams. And I believe that every young person here should work towards creating some particular world that day. And I can see Donald doing that from his work He's creating some sort of world to change the African narrative. Because in the next generation that are going to come up, what are we going to tell them? What stories are, going to, are we going to tell them? Are we going to tell them the stories of the issues that we are seeing in Africa today? Or are we going to tell them the true story of our culture? We show them our culture like um, Donald was sharing today. Or are we going to tell them you know, stories that can help them travel across the world and be able to identify who they are? And I think in order for us to practice both Ubuntu, we need to define who we are. And I think that's <coughs> important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leonard. And now we're going to go to Augustine. But while he's speaking, please, the rest of you, remember that you'll be joining in the discussion. So the questions that you have for each other, the comments that you want to make to each other, please start thinking about them. Augustine. Sure. Um, thank you, Theo, and uh, everyone else. Um, my name is Augustine Ndungo. I'm Kenyan, born and raised. Um, though you might sense that that's not how I speak, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and according to what Leonard said, growing up, I wanted to be a politician. I grew up in the 90s in Kenya when we um, had politicians as our role models. Uh, they were the supposed change makers in our society. Um, so I put myself through what Donald would call the colonial Africa education, <laughs> um, which essentially was a tunnel 
um, just make sure you get the right grades and they'll get you to the um, end of that tunnel. Um, and the end for me happened to be um, in the United States, uh, which is where Donald and I met, actually. Um, so we happened to be in two liberal arts colleges in Western Massachusetts, um, and I studied political science. Um, and at some point in my third year, um, I asked myself, um, what is the point of all this education if I'm not uh, putting it into action? Um, and in short, um, that was um, the reason why I applied to be part of this Dalai Lama Fellowship Program, um, as an opportunity for me to just put my thoughts, ideas into action. Um, and the program supported me with um, funding, so I went back to Kenya, to my community, um, and tried to work with a group of, or two groups of young people in the rural areas, um, and proposed to them that they could um, work on an agribusiness project um, as long as um, they agreed to work across ethnic lines. Um, and looking back, I, I wish I could remain as naive and ambitious as I was uh, back then. Um, but all in all, the project went well, uh, with a lot of support from the Dalai Lama Fellowship Program, uh, mentorship, coaching, um, and um, in the end, uh, what I learned mostly was that while um, the idea of using business for good um, can work, um, I needed to put myself first through the learning experience of what uh, business world um, is that I had not, um, at that point, as a politician uh, in my head, uh, paid attention to. Um, and I found about the work of social entrepreneurship while trying to figure out what uh, this combination of uh, business and uh, doing good or impact is. Um, and so, I happened to get an internship at an organization called Ashoka in Washington, D.C. Um, and I thought that was a good next step um, for myself. Um, but I remember the first time I had an interview with uh, the founder of Ashoka, Bill Drayton, and I had prepared very well, um, so I knew my questions. As a good student of the system, you know your questions, you sit down, you prepare. Um, and Bill asked me a question, um, he asked me, he didn't even ask me, tell me about yourself. He asked me, how have you changed the world? <laughs> and I thought, I thought he was crazy. I thought, um, you know, why are you asking someone who is just graduating from college about changing the world? I thought I'm supposed to, you know, uh, be getting a salary for whatever you tell me to do, um, and then I can have fun. Um, here you are telling me about changing the world. Um, what is this business? This is old people business. Um, no one told me that I need to change the world. Um, but while I try to answer that question as someone who has gone through, again, the system well, um, and I happened to think that it worked because I got the job, um, I still felt very restless after that. And I remember for, for two to three days, I, I was very restless. Um, and my restlessness eventually sort of came to be that um, it, it, was, it was because my answer that I had set, I had changed the world by setting a good role model um, to the young ones coming up behind me was not sufficient uh, as an answer. And I felt that setting a role model is something that you do just by being yourself. You don't need to be intentional about it. You don't need to care about um, that other person, as long as you focus on yourself. Um, and I looked back at that moment as a turning point to this day, um, mostly because I realized that uh, the system we have, uh, particularly in the education system, asks of us as young people to focus on ourselves. Get good grades, get a good job, get a good partner for your life, have good kids, and then I guess, oh, exit man. the stage. Um, <laughs> and nowhere along that process are you challenged to think about the other person. Um, and so I would say I embarked on a journey at that point um, that took me back uh, to Kenya four years ago this month um, and tried to work uh, through the support of organizations uh, like Ashoka um, to support um, 
the work of that I had tried to see or I, that I had seen as important, supporting young people in the continent. Um, so I work with um, entrepreneurs, um, and I've done that social entrepreneurs mostly in East Africa. Um, had the opportunity to travel across the continent, um, and in all of that work, I've seen a trajectory. Um, one is there's good work that is happening around the continent, <coughs> working with individual um, people who are making a difference in the society. Um, there's good work also happening in terms of uh, building systems and processes that we need as a society. It's essentially infrastructure, um, whether it's business incubation, um, training programs, capacity building, and that's also good work. Um, there's also good work of uh, building networks. Um, one challenge for me is that I've met most of my fellow Africans and my journey of discovering myself as an African, um, mostly through the work of traveling to conferences like this where I get to meet other people. Um, so I find this kind of work extremely important as we are moving forward. Um, but what I'm picking up as a call to action from uh, this particular conference um, is the idea that beyond networks, we need to start thinking about communities. Um, and I had a conversation with a friend just before I came here, and she's German, and she was explaining to me how the idea of community in Africa is so real, it's so present. Um, and I thought, interesting that she thought that way, um, but I don't feel the same way. I feel that as we are stuck in the process of, um, in the system, education system, <coughs> and the process of westernizing ourselves as fast as we can, um, we're losing something. We're losing the idea of community. Mm -hmm. um, this conference will be done. We'll all go back to our own different places. But how many of us can say we are going to go back to communities? Yeah. Communities that support our goals and our ambitions. How many of us, especially as young people, are going to go back to the internet and post about the work that, or the conversations we had here and call that our community? Mm -hmm. Um, how many of us are we going to find ourselves in communities that um, are diverse, that embrace diversity, even within our continent? Um, and I think that is the challenge that I take from this conference, um, that the work of community building, whether we can claim that there is a foundation through Ubuntu and Ubuntu, it's not going to happen just by itself or just by believing and we are not going to get to where we need to be if these communities of support are not going to be present in our cities, in our education systems. Um, and the challenge mostly is that we are going to have to fight um, our education system, our, our current setup, that mostly is forcing us as individuals to think about ourselves, to focus on ourselves, and supposedly end up happy. I don't see how we are going to get there if we don't think about this whole work of building communities. And that's my challenge uh, from this conference. <laughs> wow, those were amazing inputs from all of you. And so what I want to ask you, we don't, unfortunately don't have that much time for discussion. I'd like to ask each of you what response you might want to make, not necessarily to each person, but in terms of what you've heard this morning, what would be the one response that you really wanted to make? And then, Jimpa, I'd like to come to you and ask you what we should be learning from what this group of young people have been telling us. So, Donald, can I come back and start with you? Yes, <laughs> that's fine. Um, so I, I <coughs> realize the commonality of our experiences sitting here, and I realize the need for us to defy borders that separate us. Uh, you know, and for if, uh, you know, in 2002, I could be part of a project that impacted a Kenyan child, that shows that we still have the capability to network across these borders, because mm. we've done it before. Mm. So that's my takeaway. That's great, thank you. And just to tell you how small a world it is, I was at that meeting in 2002. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <Wow. laughs> Justine. Um, I think for me, telling the African narrative and going back to our roots, um, this is not something that is new. It's not a new concept. For me, it's just we need to go back. We need to revisit 
um, where we're coming from and how it was done and why it was successful back then. And then, of course, the only thing that we can do from those lessons that we're learning from there is to see how do we incorporate it into today's society because we can also not take away that we, we have moved, we have grown. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, that is, that is the comment that... Thank you. <coughs> London. Um, thank you. I think for me, a great lesson is that we need to have the fundamental conversations at home. We need to start unpacking the realities that have always been there. Uh, we need to start listening to our lives. You know, when you don't listen to your life, things just go west. But when you start listening and taking time to hear what your life is saying to you, then suddenly your paths become open. So I think that is, for me, fundamentally what, as a human race, we are naturally inclined to do. But most importantly, as Africans, you know, I was very embarrassed going to the States earlier this year. To, for me, it was the first time I sat around a table with fellows from 18 African countries. And it was the first time I'd had food from 18 African countries. Yet I stay in Africa. These guys are part of who I am. <clears throat> Yet it takes a trip to the United States for me to be able to do that. Yeah. So we need to go back <clears throat> to the fundamentals. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. um, so just to kind of, you know, um, add to what they've just said, I think it's about two things, is collaborations and conversations. Um, collaborations in the sense that it's not just I'm working on a particular project, but how do I get my project running in chapters in different um, mm -hmm. countries across the continent? So, for instance, I'm doing a project in adult literacy. I, there are some people in Kenya and Botswana that require this particular um, you know, services, and how can I get it to them? How can I connect with people? And also in conversations that let's not just leave this conversation of both Ubuntu just here, but when we go back home, how can we engage in dialogue in little small communities and try and get this message across um, throughout the year? That's, that's my own. Yeah, um, I think for me, I'm picking up um, something that speaks to me from uh, Landa, um, and that's the idea of, of uh, home and, and families. Um, as young people, I think we um, kind of face life head on, um, but home remains foundational to who we are. Um, and not to, not to say that there's a big problem, but I do feel that, um, that there is a challenge in marriages across Africa um, in families um, that we are setting up. And to some extent, it's mainly because we are moving away from um, that traditional idea. Um, and I don't want to call it traditional because then it sounds like it's wrong. But it's, it's really a family that goes beyond father, mother, and their two children. Yeah. Um, I didn't grow up close to my grandparents. And it feels like a loss. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not because I couldn't have been able to go visit them, but <coughs> I was too busy in school. <coughs> so that, to me, is something that we need to go back to. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> and I think that it's really interesting that, that some of the things that you've been saying actually link very much to some of the discussions we were having yesterday around the science. This thing of who is I and who is we and the nature of our communities. How are we defining community? Is it a community of practice or a geographical community or a community of age or multiple identities that come out in terms of how we identify communities? So there's a lot of linking that we really need to do but there's a lot that we can do. So I'm going to go to Lily, and then Jimpa, I'm going to come back to you to ask you what we should be learning from what our young people, their wisdom is telling us. Thank you. Um, in, in wrapping up, I think I'll just 
want to reflect on what the youth have been saying and um, you know, their desire for what they would like to see happening in the future. And I think one thing that's coming through very clearly is that uh, there is need, but there's also room and um, there's um, cap capability and capacity uh, in terms of the fact that as human beings, we have that capability to promote um, further engagements amongst different communities. And also, I think what's also coming out clearly is that there is definitely need to extend this conversation that has been started here um, to the rest of our African brothers and, and sisters by doing what? By creating more spaces for engagements uh, beyond just what Mind and Life has set up here. So this is a good start upon which we should build. And I don't know whether Mind and Life would be you know, interested in continuing to be a partner in doing that, but even if they are not, um, we see that it is possible for us to you know, engage with one another. And I think there's also need to acknowledge the uh, importance of not just national conversations, mm -hmm. but also transnational conversations. Mm -hmm as well as to probably bring in the leadership, uh, because in as much as you know, communities exist out there, the leadership with the kinds of policies that they, they come up with need to also ensure that they incorporate and put the communities at the center of the implementation of the policies that they come up with. And I think it's also important to carry this conversation to the African Union to make sure that it puts youth issues at the, at the center. Um, in as much as national governments can also do that, but it should also be from that point of view of, you know, that collective um, uh, union of these, these nations to do that. And so with, with, with that being the case, obviously uh, resources would be put in place that can uh, fund these transnational or cross-national conversations, because at the end of the day, uh, you do need resources to put some of these things in, in, into mm -hmm into place and to ensure their um, yeah. effective implementation. Thank you, Lily. And I think that actually the great thing is that your generation <coughs> have got so much more in the way of technology, but also in the way of imagination, mm -hmm. so that reaching across communities, across borders, actually becomes a little easier. Not to say that it's only technology, because I do think you need some interpersonal interaction <laughs> yeah. to change hearts and minds, yeah. but there are so many m more ways of reaching. So, Jimpa. Um, well, first of all, it's a real uh, honor to be part of this millennial uh, panel. <coughs> um, I have two children who are part of the millennial age. Um, a couple of things. Um, one thing that uh, struck me is how, in fact, if you look at many societies, we are not very good at creating social structures or institutional structures which would allow, you know, possibility for the youth perspective to be brought in. Mm -hmm. Somehow, <clears throat> and, and this is unfortunate because, um, you know, right here, we can feel the energy and the enthusiasm. I mean, I'm 58, so I'm kind of, going down, um, <laughs> but you can feel the energy and it's, it's, it's very kind of contagious. And you feel the energy and you feel the enthusiasm and, you know, and it's of course, all of you are very impressive. You know, the fellows here and Donald, the work that you do, the altruistic vision that you have. Uh, actually, I, I, I was deeply moved and I was actually thinking about myself at your age. Was I that mature or was, <laughs> that, that, was I that outward looking? I was a monk studying in an academic monastery. Um, so that's one thing I thought, maybe um, perhaps social scientists need to take a serious look at how we can build structures where youth perspectives could play a much more active role in shaping the conversation. But the other thing that I also felt is that these days, um, you know, with the social media and, you know, when it comes to digital media, there's no boundary. So there is a platform. 
Um, I'm not a big social media person. I haven't touched my Facebook for about six years now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there is a platform, and I think there is a, a real opportunity to cross the borders through the social media. And a couple of things that keep coming up, which is the ownership of your story and getting clarity about who I am, who you are, and the narrative, looking, taking a serious look at uh, the the education system, and yesterday Lily brought up this important question about knowing your history. I think all of this is really crucial because if you don't tell your own story, someone else will. Exactly. And, and this is where it, you are the best person to tell your story. Mm. And in Africa, you know, the point about community is very true, looking from outside. That's one thing we first think about Africa. Now, it may be the actual the case on the ground, which is more complicated, but that's what we see from outside. <clears throat> and that is clearly a strength. And there is a shared philosophy in Boto and Ubuntu, which really provides a shared language, a shared value, societal value. So there is enough to build on kind of a pan-African narrative, and that can eventually <coughs> transcend the colonial kind of you know, consciousness and colonial me trauma and memory. And that is a work that needs to be done. Uh, because if you don't do that, you know, there is no confidence of who you are. And if there is no confidence of who you are, it's very difficult to make an impact you know, on the other. I mean, a, a, you know, a good impact on other comes from someone who is quite sure of, you know, you cannot be completely clear of who you <laughs> are because we're always evolving. Yeah. But at least you need to have some basic mm. set of understanding of who you are. And those, I think, are important lessons that are coming from here. Um, and I'm deeply inspired by the story of all of you and how much actually you think about the world, how much you think about the society, and how much you think about how to bring <coughs> the communities together and using your privileged position to be able to serve those who are less privileged. And that, I think, is a very important ethical value yeah. because yeah. often we get comfortable <coughs> in our own yeah. you know, place of privilege. You know? mm. Then the days go by, we get, we get into a sort of a set routine, <coughs> and then you know, 10 years later, the, the time has already gone. Mm. So I think that those are things that I really took away from here. And uh, it's pity that His Holiness is not here because he would have loved this particular youthful energy and the enthusiasm and a real optimism. I mean, you know, there are struggles, but all of you are very optimistic that you can actually change the world. Yeah. And that is the enthusiasm that I think we need, yeah. It's very true. So, unfortunately, we're going to need to stop. One of the lessons um, I think all of us constantly are learning is about the importance of bringing in youth views and youth perspectives much, much earlier, as you were saying, Justine, because it makes such a difference. And um, just as we're wrapping up, I want to say to you, I am so proud of all of you guys. You are making, you know people say, be what you want to see happen. And sitting here and listening to all of you, listening to your intelligence and your compassion and your inclusiveness, this is how, as Africa, we are going to connect our traditions, our good traditions. Let's remember the good ones and get rid of the bad ones. <laughs> um, this is how we're going to make the connections. This is how we're going to make the world that we want to be. And this is how Africa will help the world find its soul. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're now going to have a 10 minute break. Get up, stretch your legs comfort break or whatever you want to call it and we're just going to have a slight change on board and then we'll come up um, for Pumla's presentation. Thank you all very much. So we're now coming to the last substantive session of this meeting um, and we will have our discussion, we will have a great presentation from Pumla and then we'll have a discussion on stage, and then we will open it up 
for only a very short period of time, because we need to keep to time this morning, um, to the audience. So those of you who have comments and questions that you're really burning to ask, please get ready, but please, 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 can I ask everybody, try and keep to less than a minute, because the longer you take, the fewer people will have the opportunity to interact. So I'm asking you to take it on as your responsibility for us to be as inclusive as possible. Great. So we're now going in to our final session, and it is my absolute delight to welcome Pumla Gobodo Madikizela um, to join us in, on the panel of presenters, and she's actually going to be talking to us, exploring the meaning of Ubuntu, and actually looking at the politics of for forgiveness within that. She's done such amazing work. You can read her bio in the program that's available, but um, I think many, many of us um, know of her work in relation to forgiveness and the challenges and the rewards and the opportunities. Pumla, Thank I hand you. over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Theo. Thank you um, very much, especially um, to Cliff, who with his colleagues, Kali and others, have been uh, organizing this event for more than a year. It's a wonderful privilege for me to be associated with this conversation that spans uh, time, space, and a uh, real wonderful privilege to be here in Botswana. Uh, I come from the generation uh, of South Africans um, whose memory of Botswana is a wonderful memory of connection with the struggles of, uh, uh, for, for, for liberation of the people of South Africa. And right then, in those years, in the 1960s, especially in 1970s and 80s, the generosity and Ubuntu that came from this country is something that we South Africans will never forget. I know that... Um, I know that many uh, of your people in Botswana suffered as a result of our being here, of our uh, people being in South Africa. Uh, and and I, I just feel that just returning to this place, having come back in the 1980s to uh, ostensibly to music shows, mm -hmm. it's just this wonderful memory when I landed and uh, driving to to the to the university here. It just filled my heart with such warmth. So thank you very much that you thought of organizing the event at this place. I want to start with you with what you, uh, the way you introduced me as uh, someone who's worked on Ubuntu and uh, on on themes of forgiveness. And to state at the outset that my work now is moving away from the word forgiveness as a word, because I find it to be a word that is misleading, doesn't really capture the essence of what you want to talk about when, when you're talking about Ubuntu. It's also a word that's become in my country a bit of a swear word. <coughs> the, the current generation, for a range of reasons, you know, things have not changed. Young people continue to experience the transgenerational poverty that their parents were, were exposed to. The, uh, 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 the lives are uh, lives of humiliation, of, uh, of lack, of absence, of loss. And so they find it difficult to connect with this notion of what it is to be human with Ubuntu. However, I think that it's very important for us to articulate this notion of Ubuntu as an African ethical orientation. There is a, a, a desire on our part to integrate the notion of Ubuntu with the themes uh, of philosophy, of ethics, as it is understood in the Western world. There is a desire to do that. And, and, and there's a reason for that, because we want to put these experiences right in the center of these global debates about 
what it is to be human with these large philosophical debates. But I think that it's also important for us to articulate it as an African concept, to remember, to name it as an African concept, so that we don't madly, we, 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 it does not become colonized within the general kind of discourse of, you know, philosophical concept. It is truly an African concept, and I think we have to, we have to, we have to respect that, to dignify that. And I, and I don't think that it's necessarily about essentializing the concept. I'm also of the view that Ubuntu is very much a human experience. Nonetheless, it's also, in terms of its origins, as a concept that originates within the African philosophical, people don't think of African philosophy, of African experiences as experiences that can birth large philosophical ideas. There are these scholars of philosophy. I mean, you get scholars of African philosophy. They are a handful, they, and they are sort of on the margins. It's never about this is the philosophy of what life is about. That's what we need to reclaim this concept and put it in the center. So I want to begin with the way that the concept has been uh, uh, articulated within the broader scholarship. It's always put in contrast as a, as a concept that, that is in contrast with the, uh, 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 the Cartesian notion of I think therefore I am. And the opposite of that uh, 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 is supposed to be uh, 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 you, what is the what is the English thing? Uh, I am because we are. Now, when you think about that, there's nothing like that in African languages. You, there's no you can't translate that. You know, I, I am because we are. You, there's, there's no expression like that in an African language. You, I try to think about how does one translate this idea of I am because, therefore we are, I am because we are. There's, there isn't an expression in an African language that translates those words in that way. Therefore, in my view, what best captures this notion of Ubuntu is actually back to the African languages themselves. In my language, Tosa, and in other languages, we say, umdu ngumdu gabanye abandu. Mutu kibutu. There you go. So, umdu ngumdu gabanye abandu. And if we translate that literally, a human being or a person is a person because other people exist. What that means is that my subjectivity depends on being witnessed by others. I cannot be a human being, a subject. The, the very notion of being a human subject, that notion of ungumdu, ungumdu because you relate, you are in relationship with others. And that notion of being in relationship with others means you are being witnessed by others. Others are there, to confirm, as it were. You know, we had a, a musician in South Africa, she died, uh, uh, Brenda Fass, she says, umundu, umundu aga you know, she talks about confirming a human being, you know, and, and, and it's another story. But I, I, I like that notion of confirming, you are confirming, in other words, you are a subject in the context of relational others because I see you. Now, some of you who know Zulu will know the expression of greeting, Saubona. That does not come from nowhere. There's a reason that that word is Saubona. I see you. Saubona, I see you. And, and that, that, that form of greeting, even before we open our mouths to engage with each other, I acknowledge your existence. I recognize you. I'm going to talk in a moment about a deeper aspect of recognition, but I just wanted to speak for a moment about the, this issue, this idea of who we are as subjects in the world. We are subject because we are witnessed by others. That is a level of recognition. There's another, I have 50 minutes, so I have to touch on, 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 these, uh, on these aspects, which hopefully we will have a broader conversation about. 
The second issue I want to, to talk about in relation to Ubuntu and being witness and recognizing the other has to do with who we are as embodied subjects. You know, the scholars who talked, the philosophers who talked about thinking and therefore being, it was almost like, you know, separating the human body from the human mind. This kind of beingness, being witnessed by others, existing, feeling a sense of who I am in relation to another because you are, we are engaging, we are in relationship, also takes into account the embodied sense of being. Who are we as bodies, as black bodies, as white bodies, as Indian bodies, as all colors of bodies? You, we bring ourselves who we are as bodies, you know, somebody, a person you are is somebody. So you are an embodied being. And therefore, the body is very important in this idea of relating to the other. We are bringing each other's body, we are engaging through our body. And here is a deeper illustration of this notion of the body. In the work that I do, and part of the reason why I moved away from the word forgiveness, most, many of the people who spoke about forgiving spoke about something happening at a deeper, at a level beyond simply the words, I forgive. And so we were challenged to ask the question, what is it that happens when people forgive? And I'm not talking about forgiveness in the context of tragedy, of huge things, of major irreparable things that have happened to people. Someone killing some, your loved one, your father, your daughter, your son, your wife. And then these people come together and and, and the one who has lost says, I forgive you, is totally counterintuitive. And scholars before we had these kinds of experiences in South Africa, for instance, with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, scholars like Hannah Arendt said, it cannot happen, it's impossible, right? You forgive ordinary transgressions, Hannah Arendt says. says but these, these radically even acts, these acts that are radically evil, these evil that were committed, you know, by Achman, who was really like a trope for her, for her work, radically evil acts are not only unforgivable, you can't even apologize for them, and you can't apologize for them because there is no sense of, of, of imagining what it is that this person has done to destroy the world. To, to cause so much destruction. And she went further and to say, you can't even punish them. It's unpunishable, because what do you say? Because when you punish through the law, at least, you punish because you say you've done this, and this is the measure of what the transgression is, and so, so much you know, means you can be punished for 20 years, and so much for 30 years, and so much for life. But these kinds of indescribable, unspeakable acts, they're unpunishable. This is why, in my view, the legal uh, uh, jurisprudence, prosecutorial kind of processes, do not help us to understand these processes. You know, if, if we are going to stay with the justice, even justice in the context of human rights, it's very limited. It does not bring us closer to understanding these kinds of shifts that allow us to have these conversations. Why is it? What makes it possible for someone who has been wounded in this way to reach out with forgiveness? We need to go, we need to, uh, 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 to, to draw on different kinds of perspectives to understand. The law can help us because it's so limited. This other perspective that allows us to speak about, for instance, the body. What's the role of the body? And here is what many of the people I've interviewed who have, inter who have forgiven at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission tell me. We try in interviewing these people to understand 
What exactly? We are not satisfied with people saying, I, f I decided to forgive this person because, you know, uh, they felt, they expressed remorse. We want to understand what is it that actually happens because we know that when we are wounded, we carry the wounds deep inside of ourselves. The trauma ruptures the sense of who we are. It redefines us. It undoes us. And so what is it about these processes that allow this kind of reconnection through ways of, re of forgiveness? We have to ask the question, what happens exactly to that story that the person carries within? And lo and behold, we were brought into connection with the body. Women talking about a concept, I will call it a concept because we need to name it something, a concept that is really known by many African people, Inimba. In fact, it's known by many people, but Inimba. Inimba, in, if you try to find a, an English word that closely describes what it is, we might call it the umbilical cord. But that's a very rough translation. Inimba means much more than that. Inimba is a kind of a feeling, you know, that parents, parents, but especially mothers, talk about, you know, kwasika inimba. When mothers say, yasika inimba, they don't only say those words in relation to their own children. My umbilical cord cuts, something cut deep inside me, and you ask them, where exactly? And many women will say, it's behind the navel. And it's an interesting in an interesting location within the body, that place of the navel. But let me say something a little bit more about Inimba. So mothers will say, someone tells a story. They are not connected to them. They're not their children. It's a man. It's an older man. It's not a child. And someone reaches out with an embrace. And then they explain to you that kusike Inimba. When a woman says kusike inimba, they mean something cut very deep inside my womb. Something moved inside my womb. In fact, they talk about a movement. And the interesting thing about this movement is that it's a movement that connects with this person. You think at least that the person standing in front of you is the person with whom this connection is established. But in conversations with some of these women, the link is not necessarily with the person who is asking forgiveness, who is the killer. The link is with the mother of this person. And this is what I want us to talk about today. I'm hoping at least you can elaborate on because it's something that I'm also uh, 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 trying to theorize about. So here in psychoanalysis, they simplify it, they say it's the presence of the third. So it, it's a term, you know, it's a working term. It's the third. The third enables the connection between the two. So it's an intersubjective relationship that is actually enabled by the existence of the third, as the psychoanalyst will say. But if we stay within the African context of relationship, of a, a relational kind of context, we will understand that this response to this man evokes this feeling and connection to the mother of this man. Why? Because I am like the mother. The mother has the child, has born this child. The mother has a vision for their child. The mother names this child something. You know, one uh, uh, um, a story that is on my mind right now, a mother names her son Tabelo a name that means umtandazo in my Posa language and in English it means prayer. What was in the mother's mind when she named this child Tapelo, a prayer? She gives birth to this child, names in prayer, and then this child goes and kills. Not one person, but several people, works with the apartheid government, becomes a, a, a part of the hit squad to kill enemies, so-called enemies of the state. And now I am faced with this man who killed my child and he is in front of me laying himself bare. 
asking forgiveness. And what happens to me as the person forgiving, I see him, but before him, between me and him, I see the mother. And I ask the question, I wonder, how does the mother feel about that? And that is the point of recognition. When we speak about these encounters, the notion of recognition of the other, it's not simply a seeing the other as a human other in the face of the other in front of us. It's actually seeing and going beyond recognition to actually put yourselves in the shoes of the other and being like them and engaging in these kinds of questions. What is going on in the mind and the heart of this mother when she hears about the deeds that the son have done, has done? That is the point of recognition that I would like us to think about when we think about Ubuntu. Ubuntu, that's what Ubuntu is. You really put yourself, you are in, as Bishop Tutu speaks about, the inextricable interwovenness of who we are. That is what the Archbishop is talking about. It's an inextricable interwovenness that standing before this man, seeing this man, my life is so interwoven with his mother that my feelings of pain and hurt are the mother's feelings of pain and hurt. I imagine the mother. And this is why imagination is such an important aspect of our conversations about these experiences. Imagination. To be able to imagine what's happening in the heart of the other person. How, what stirs the other person. What is the pain that they are going through. And the body being so central in that because now I am transported. My, my, the, the, the rupture and the rumbling and, and the turmoil within myself is not so much about this young man. It's about the mother who is experiencing the same turmoil, the same birth pains that I had when I had my own child I experiencing the same person that this woman had with this boy, with this young man who now becomes a killer. How does she, how does she look at her? How does she feel about that? <coughs> so the last part of my sharing with you, uh, uh, the, uh, my presentation, I want to share with you some maybe two illustrative examples, because it's very important for us. You know, human beings are not philosophical stances. You know, you can, you know, theorize, but when you actually witness what happens when people engage and you witness how these kinds of experiences unfold, it, 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 it brings home to you what it is that one is talking about. I served on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and even though at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we were guided by this notion of reconciliation, that the dialogue of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was a dialogue that brings people together. But even as we did that, even as we approached the work of the commission inspired by this by this orientation. We never imagined that we would have actual examples of people forgiving after so much tragedy. We thought, you know, excuse me, reconciliation is a, it's a, it's a political, which was a political orientation, you know, and it was a language that actually allowed these kinds of conversations to take place. And I just want to say something very, uh, almost like a footnote before I, I, I share one or two examples. The truth and reconciliation, if, if we go back to a comment I made earlier in relation to uh, Hannah Arendt's work who says these acts are unpunishable, precisely because they are unpunishable, a different kind of response was necessary because the courts, you know, 
these are, and what do you say? You know, Nazi perpetrators were all sent to the gallows. They all, you know, went and they were, well, not all, the 22 of them, at least in Nuremberg, that first major trial, they were hanged. And from our reading of what happened then, none of them were given a chance to reflect on what they did. To so much so that a majority of them, they went to the gallows, still hailing Hitler. Before they were hanged, they would go, hail Hitler. So there was no engagement, no opportunity for reflection. Here, this process of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission challenges perpetrators. It actually forces them to be accountable. It doesn't say, you are monsters, you know, you will be hanged. It challenges them to reclaim their sense of humanity and from that position to face the other, from the position of being responsible other. This is why it was possible for perpetrators, even the hardcore perpetrators, such as, for instance, the person I write about in my work, Eugene de Kock, was known as prime evil, who was relegated and thrown out and really quarantined in the world of quintessentially other. Never shall reclaim a sense of being human. And yet, this person and a few others, and not many of them to be sure, and we can talk about why later, but these people, because, precisely because, the way that the commission was structured, you speak the truth, you are granted amnesty. You speak the whole truth, you are granted. It's not, a, it's not a, a, an automatic amnesty, you, you know, as in other countries. It's not a blanket amnesty, and it's not superficial. It's very weird, an investigative committee to investigate whether people actually spoke the truth. You are required to speak the truth. And here is a point, important point about that in relation to what we're talking about. It allowed perpetrators to feel a sense of humanity for themselves. Because when people destroy and kill and murder, they dehumanize the self. You, have to dis you can't see your own humanity. The humanity that binds you to another. Obabu wundu, that wutu, that connects you to the other person, it's cut off. It's non-existent. This is why you can kill, murder, torture, but here is a moment that says, look into yourself. This is an opportunity for you. You are going to be given amnesty. But by speaking the truth, there is a truth that is factual. This is what happened. This is what, who gave me orders and so on. And many perpetrators did that. You know, they recited the truth as they were required to say. However, because... This is about truth-telling. There was also a few of them who dared to actually dig deep into their conscience and to face the truth of their hearts. And that is why they were able then to acknowledge that what they did was evil. For those others, they continue, continue to say it was a war, you know, to justify it in a range of ways. I was obeying orders and so on. For these others, they know it's not just about obeying orders. I did it myself. I pulled the trigger. I killed that woman's daughter. And I remember her pain in the eyes, in her face. And that facing that truth, facing that aspect of the truth, allows them, therefore, to face the lie within themselves the lie that silenced this conscience, and it reopens that moment of truth and allows them to feel a sense of remorse. Because what is remorse if it is not the ultimate human moment? It is the ultimate human moment where the perpetrator reconnects with the silenced humanity. And this happens because a Truth and Reconciliation Commission says, Thou shalt not hide from thyself. A court of law says, we encourage you to hide. If you get the best lawyer, you can hide and they can make sure that the truth disappears. 
here, and, and as a result, the person never is able to face that moment of truth within. These kinds of processes allows the transcendence that allows perpetrators to face the truth and opens up the space for the other person who is wounded to see the humanity in them. I'm not saying that the act itself is human, but the moment opens up the space for that dialogue between people who are human beings to say to them that you have hurt me, this is my pain, and the other one to say, I feel such shattered, shattering shame for what I've done, for the pain I have caused you. Here is another expression from my language. Intloni zikwenza umdu. Shame makes you human. When people commit these acts and they continue to deny and to justify, they are hiding away from their shame. But when they face their shame, they are now reconnecting with what it is to be human. As I say in my language, can you imagine that? Shame makes you human. If you can have shame for what you've done, then you are reclaiming your right to become a human being again. And so these people, these moments of encounter between victims and perpetrators, it's a reconnection. These are human moments that are being created. So here is one story. I think I'll give one because of time. I can give two. So, thank you. <laughs> so, one is, uh, the first one that I want to, to share with you illustrates, again, the transgenerational impact of a process such as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Because we had a truth, uh, the, uh, uh, I also want to mention that there are lots of other challenges and problems of the Truth Commission, one of which is that it didn't address the very structural issues that brought about apartheid and the suffering of apartheid. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission was not doing that. People say they faulted for that, but I think it's a wrong faulting of the Truth Commission. The Truth Commission was meant as a different process to open the path for that other structural transformation to happen. Our government today has not put out their efforts to do that is what is important to transform our society. They've become very selfish, they've become thinking about themselves, corruption is huge, that's who should be faulted. Truth and Reconciliation Commission opened a different path. As a result, young children who, children who were young at the time of the crimes by apartheid are now drawing from the language of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission because we created the, the, the language the language enabled us to put this stuff on the table to say, now we know it's all here. We know how to talk about it. It creates language. Because how do you talk about someone who's killed my loved one and burn them on a stake, you know, and throw their ashes in the river to hide evidence? How do you talk about that? The commission allowed us to talk about that. It doesn't mean that we are justifying it. It doesn't mean that by finding a way of understanding it, you are saying that it can be explained. It still may not, we cannot even still not be able to explain it, but it does open a path for us to reconnect with who we are as human beings living together in a country. So children, one daughter, two daughters who were a few months old when their parents were killed by Eugene de Kock, who in South Africa was known as prime evil. Eugene de Kock came and his men came in and out of Botswana, across the borders to murder enemies of the state, so-called enemies of the state. His, his whole establishment was supported by the apartheid government. They were given funds, state payers, uh, uh, taxpayers' monies to support their operations of death squads. They came to this country and killed many people of the liberation forces. One of those people uh, who was killed was the mother of a woman called Marcia Koza. Marcia Koza was in her late 20s, about three years ago, when she went to visit Eugene de Kock, her mother, I think actually her mother may have even been killed in Botswana, either here, I think it was in Botswana. Her mother 
she was five months old, uh, a few months old when her mother was killed by Eugene de Kock's men because he was heading up the COVID operations unit of the apartheid government. He had an official position. He was not a rogue murderer. He, was, he had a position. He was the head of COVID operations under the apartheid government. And now, years later, she's living with this memory of the mother who died in ways that she still is unable to understand. No one has explained to her why her mother was targeted. She decides in her late 20s, she's going to visit Eugene de Kock in prison and confront him and ask him, why did the mother die? Why was the mother killed? She's get, she's, this is the wonderful thing about the, commi the commission, the agency that victims reclaim a sense of agency. You know, I can do this. I can act. This is an action that I myself am determining. It's long after the Truth Commission. She goes to prison. She seeks out to meet this man. And in that encounter, the first thing she notices is Eugene de Kock is stepping out of, by the way, Eugene de Kock was granted amnesty for some of the crimes and not granted amnesty for crimes, for some, one crime for which he was serving a life sentence because there was some inconsistency and the commission felt that he, he could not be granted amnesty for that particular crime. So he's stepping out of the cells and she's waiting in the waiting area. And, and the moment Eugene de Kock sets his eyes on her, sitting in the distance, he trips and almost falls. And the first thing he says to her as he's greeting her, he says, you look so much like your mother. And for her, that is an important statement of recognition. He remembers that you look so much like your mother. He has not, they have not talked yet. They have not engaged. You look so much like your mother. So he remembers the mother's face. He may have killed her, but that face. And so much so that he almost trips. And I'm thinking, as she's telling the story, it's like he's seeing a ghost of the mother. And indeed, Eugene de Kock is one of the perpetrators who lives with these ghosts. I'll, if I have time, I'll say more about that, maybe during Q&A which is the danger, again, of remorse, the danger of facing these truths, what it does to the perpetrator who has done these terrible things. So they engage in conversation. She's asking, she's got a lot of questions, you know, what was my mother wearing? What did she say? What did she look like? She's asking all questions that you and I might think they're inconsequential. She wants to know every little detail about because he is, the, he is the last person to have seen the mother. You see how much power he has in her memory. He's the last person to have seen the mother. He may have caused the death, but in terms of the kinds of things that she wants to know about, he is the answer to all those unanswered questions, besides all the reasons why she was killed. Now, here is a very poignant moment when we had her at my university, we asked her to come and share with us her meeting with Eugene de Kock, and in a room of this kind, I asked her what was the most memorable moment for her in this conversation with Eugene de Kock. She describes the last few minutes towards the end, because she only had an hour. She just looked at the time and she saw it's almost time up. And I still have so many questions. And she wanted now to rush all the questions. She says, the more I was asking, and Cook was answering the questions, and she says, the more I was asking the questions, the more anxious I got about time, I realized I was getting, coming closer and closer to him. And at some point, our knees were touching. Because you can imagine these small tables in prison. They're sitting across the table. Our knees were touching. And then she says, I became aware that I was so close to him because I was asking questions. I became so close that I felt as if we were breathing the same air. Our noses were so close to each other that we were breathing the same air. And I thought to myself, what a powerful metaphor 
breathing the same air. You know, that, that's the place that, in terms of this relatedness, one to the other, an embodied sense of presence of each other, this inextricable connection that Archbishop Tutu talks about, is that kind of so connected are we that we are connected and breathing, you know, in the air that you breathe out is, you know, the other person breathes in. So it's almost like something that passes through our veins is connecting us, if you can elaborate on the metaphor. And just to end with one other story of the mothers who are the ones who introduced me to this notion of inimba. One woman who was, she passed away now, her son was killed, was uh, uh, shot, dead in the face, she couldn't recognize her son, she says, when she was going through Moog, after Moog, looking for the body of her son, she says, I could only recognize my son with his feet. He was totally unrecognizable. And this is a woman who was going every day to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to listen to the testimonies of white police officers of the apartheid government, denying, making excuses, justifying what they did. And she says, I was going to this knowing that these people are not going to speak the truth, but I wanted them to see me, that they did not destroy me. She had special, you know, things. She made a hat, someone, you know, knitted a hat. She made, she, she made beadwork. She made a bead, neck, beaded necklace. She said, I wanted to look good so that they could see that they did not destroy me, which is what they wanted to do. I wanted to look the way that I do. I wanted to pay attention to how I looked so that they can see me. I want them to recognize that I am a proud human being. They may have treated my son inhumanely and killed him like the dog, which they did. In fact, they would kill them and then they would tie them with ropes, pretending to the outside world that these men were covered with bombs and so they're unsafe even in death. It's a pretext a narrative that they were trying to, uh, to generate uh, in, in, in the public, to the public. This woman then encounters a black man, this man was called Tabelo, his name meaning prayer, who was a black person working with the white police as the, uh, um, the informer, the police informer. They were trained to kill, they were part of a murder squad. And this woman talks about these mothers, and I'll talk about this particular one who was the first one to talk about Inimba to me. She says, when this man wanted to speak to us, we were on the commission, he wanted to meet with the mothers. We had to prepare the mothers for about a week for this meeting with this young man because we did not know what would you know, transpire. We met with him, of course, to, establish, to make sure that his intentions were pure, for want of a better term and was satisfied that he wanted to connect with the mothers because he was burdened. And it was not only about wanting to unburden themselves, he wanted to show how much shame, how much pain he felt for what he had done. So we organized the meeting. And for the mothers, for this particular woman, she says, just that he asked to meet with us, for me, it was enough to already begin to forgive him because by virtue of asking to see us, it meant that he recognized our pain. I still had to hear him. I still had to hear what he says, of course, because I couldn't just forgive him, but I was already in a state of forgiveness. And she is the one who talked about how this man's sense of remorse, and, and she, she speaks about how he laid himself bare. He made himself naked. Wazombula, you know, my, the, the Kosa language, African language, are so dramatic. Wazombula, which means you shed off. You know, wazombula, wakul, wazombula, you shed off, you, you bring yourself in your nakedness. This is what this man did. And for her, this was a sign of the essence of remorse. And she says, remorse can't be evil. Remorse can't be evil. That's what you are as a human being. You can't bear 
he bared himself. It's not just bearing the soul, it's bearing the body. And so what happens is that it then evokes the nakedness, the original form of a child in her womb. It evokes that nakedness. It's interesting, the womb. I mean, when you think about it, again, one of the women, when I asked, where exactly is it? And she says it's behind the navel. When you think about it, the navel is a point of cut, right? You cut off, when a human being is birthed, you cut off the umbilical cord. And the navel is the mark of that cut off. And so it makes sense that the reconnection has to happen at that point as well, right? That when these women feel inimba behind the navel, it's a dramatic way of reconnecting with that moment of nakedness, which is to say the moment of utter and absolute truth. And so this is why when we ask the question, how is it possible? Because people still ask, you know, Hannah Arendt would probably say, you know, and, and some scholars, in fact, say, oh, this is a reaction formation, it's, it's a defense, it's not, they don't understand, you can't forgive, it's not possible. And this is why I think the word is misleading. We need to get to the essence of what is it that actually happens in order to appreciate the sheer possibility of the impossible. But then when we speak about the impossibility, this is why it's possible. It's all of these kind of things that layers and layers that you can't explain it by saying, you know, it's a change of heart. You know, these people train people to forgive. 12 steps from step one to step 12. You arrive at step, step, step 12, you're forgiven. It, it doesn't get us to understand the complexity. And that is the African notion, the, the, this idea of even unraveling and trying to, to, to peel the layers, to explore and to explore deeper. We do through the African language, which allows this to happen. You, you ask the question when this young man says, Bazaliba, my parents forgive me. If I say it in English, you know, it's like any old person can say, I forget, how dare you say you asked me to forgive? How dare you call me as my son's killer, my parent? But in my language, when you say, Bazalibam, ditela ukolo, it touches something in the other person, the parent, the person who is standing as a representative of the parent right there. It's almost like they represent the whole community. And those words, the words, the language itself, the cultural language, the cultural meanings bring us closer and closer to this elaboration of what it means, what this notion, this concept of Ubuntu means. So thank you. 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 Thank you very much. Ukumla, that was just amazing. I didn't want you to stop talking, but I know that we also want to open up a little bit to um, people to have your questions and your comments and, and your input. Um, so I'm actually just going to open it up to the panel here. I'm going to ask you to try and be concise so that we also have an opportunity to open it up to the floor. Um, it's really difficult to even think of what to say <laughs> in the face of all of that. Mandasa, please. Thank you, my sister, for a job well done. Thank you. It calls for courage to do what you did. And it again calls for courage to share these sad stories with us. Yes, many people came forward to ask for forgiveness. It calls for courage to ask for forgiveness. It also calls for courage to forgive. <laughs> it's not easy to just say, I'm sorry. 
people say it from the word of mouth. If that story has no story in your heart, it is never a story. <laughs> this is what I see in your talk. And um, this war of asking for forgiveness is still with us in human minds, human lives. It's going on, the torture of one another. If we were to open the minds of every person on earth, you will see that the war is still in process. My dear friends, before you just walk to your enemy and say, I'm sorry, I would encourage you to meditate over your sorry and get proper guidance from the source of life. You feel the pain of that person you have made it. Feel it first. How is it treating you? Are you comfortable with what you feel about someone you murdered and tortured? <clears throat> we need uh, to ask for guidance from spirits, my dear friends. If we are truly to say sorry and ask for forgiveness, and you forgive. This is a very challenging topic, Mama. It's a serious issue. The stories you are relating <laughs> cannot be described with human language. Mm -hmm. You need just to be there and witness. Mm -hmm. Then you'll begin to understand. <laughs> That's what I seem to see in this beautiful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Jimpa. Um, thank you for the very, very inspiring presentation. And um, <clears throat> I love the way in which you have identified two key features of Ubuntu or Botho, the relational dimension and the embodied subjectivity. Um, and also in your presentation, <coughs> you made a powerful illustration of how the body plays a role. And that body's role is really an integral part of the healing process. Um, so I was particularly thinking, and also I appreciate your point that it, is, it has to be understood as an African philosophy. It's an African concept. But I was thinking about universal, universal ability, mm. you know, because mm. I'm a kind of a universalist at heart. Mm. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and I know in Canada, for example, where I'm from, um, there has been an attempt to have Truth and Reconciliation Commission with the Native Americans because there is a lot of trauma there, the way in which the white majority has treated the Native Americans, particularly you know, t uh, taking away young children and putting them in um, mm -hmm. forced um, uh, you know, um, schools and, and so on, which has led to a huge amount of generation of trauma. And, but I've always wondered why it wasn't that successful. And to what extent your sense is that they haven't been able to really bring this body role, this relational dimension, this subjectivity defined in relational terms, that it seems to be so much part of this healing process as you were describing. So do you have any opinion on that? And also my question is, while being completely African in its concept, in, in, in its <coughs> how can we make it more applicable mm. universally in the other context? Mm. Because clearly there is a tremendous resource here, mm. Mm. and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's experience has demonstrated that power. Mm. You know, I, I absolutely agree with you, I, I, and I'm, I'm, I, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't 
universalize, <coughs> is the word, um, these concepts. But what I'm saying is, its source has to be acknowledged, sure. you know, uh, uh, the roots of this concept, of this, of this knowledge, it's, it's a knowledge, you know, it's, it's a knowledge, uh, a philosophical way of life that is African. I do believe that it, it does not only belong to Africans. I believe that it's something that can be shared, can be experienced. It's, not, it's like saying forgiveness belongs to Christians, simply because its roots are from Jesus Christ, you know, pronounced on forgiveness. And I've said uh, elsewhere that we need to, uh, uh, to secularize forgiveness so that people don't say it's just the kind of thing that Ashford Tutu does. It's, it's too far removed. I can't do it. It's like for the very holy. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, it's, it's, it, it, you know, thinking about Ubuntu is along those lines, but I think in terms of ownership, you know, and, and in part because everything African tends to be relegated to the margins mm -hmm. of knowledge. It's not something that's part of the central, you know, knowledge uh, uh, debate about what is knowledge, philosophical knowledge. It's almost like an add-on. <clears throat> this is why this conference is so important because it's really recognizing, recognizes the essence, the, the centrality of this concept and our role <coughs> is how do we integrate our understanding so that this kind of way of being to another uh, uh, is, is accessible to others as well. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission Aspects of the Truth Commission can be replicated, but it can never happen in the same way. It's true. The kinds of examples that happened at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission have empowered us to, 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 to explore new avenues of inquiry. I mean, there's publications on forgiveness that came after since the Truth Commission Really, it grew, you know, remorse. Remorse is still perhaps not, not even that well researched yet. But all these concepts came because people could see it's possible. So the very fact that it's possible, we need to think about what makes it possible. So to answer your question, why has it not worked? One of the reasons is that when people who conduct these events have a certain orientation. Uh, they bring in their orientation. In other words, if the orientation is, we as white Canadians are designing this process, it's going to be infused with a lot of some of the way that you know, white Can Canadians operate in relation to, uh, to Aboriginal people and their history. Mm. The power of the Truth Commission in South Africa is that it was birthed within the community, <coughs> firstly, by Nelson Mandela and his people, and its operation was, was con conducted by many voices across communities. To the extent that this was the case, members of the commission were drawn from diverse communities. And the people who suffered themselves <clears throat> were very central. I mean, if you think about Archbishop Tutu, his own story of persecution by the apartheid government, it's knowing that in the blood, and some of the white people on the commission themselves were persecuted as white people who were on the side of the anti-apartheid struggle. So there was a presence of people who knew what is important in this process. You want to hear something in a particular way. You want to hear the truth in a particular way. And so we were very conscious. And I think because there was a presence of people who had suffered on the commission, there was sensitivity for the other as well. So that the space was, such, was broadened. So that white people were victims of the anti-apartheid <coughs> movement. <coughs> also had space. We thought about this. We thought, how do, at the beginning, there were white people were not supporting the commission. We thought about, what is it that would make white people's stories present at the Truth Commission? 
And where does that come mm. from? It comes from this sense of connecting with the other, thinking about how, you know, what about the pain of the other? And then thinking about how do you open the space so that that pain matters as much as my pain? It's those kinds of consciousness. And so if there can be a certain awareness of what people need, these processes can, can work. They, 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 they fall or rise depending on how you create the space for the dialogue to take place. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Lily. Thank you. Sister. Take more than one question. Yeah. For that yeah. profoundly moving narrative. Uh, oh, it's not it's on. on? It's on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much for that profoundly moving narrative about your experiences in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, and um, the statement that comes out so clearly that the human spirit <coughs> is very uh, strong and resilient. Um, my, my comment, that might even be a question, is um, how do we actually create uh, continuous spaces for dialogue around uh, specific issues um, of atrocity, but also um, the wide-ranging issues that we constantly confront in our communities that really require us to reflect on our boto. Um, and I'm thinking here that in that particular situation you have put before us, uh, you have said that the people that comprise the commission came from different communities or diverse communities. Um, I'm wondering um, how that seed has been <coughs> planted. The seed is very important, is very uh, useful, obviously, to have in the communities. Those particular individuals that came, I consider them to be a potential seed. So um, what has been done to ensure that that seed is cultivated and nurtured so that um, that very inexplicable uh, capacity to forgive can be fostered in, in all our, of our communities. And, and also, what other spaces um, can be created? And I, I'm talking to all of us uh, beyond this dialogue for this continuous conversation uh, that would help us to uh, not only um, use what we, we have today, but also to uh, rediscover the things that we have lost um, that we can then integrate into our way forward uh, for healing, for flourishing, and so on. Thank you. Okay. I'm no, please go ahead and answer yes. this. And then if we can have the mics ready, I'm going to take three short questions. Okay. Three, that's it. Okay. You know, there is always a danger. Uh, first of all, I want to know, what is your name? Lily, Lily Mafela. Lily, Lily, thank you very yes. much, Lily. Um, when we think about setting up these uh, spaces for dialogue, <coughs> if, if, we, if we think about it as a space for forgiveness to happen, it turns people off. I find that it's useful to really, I mean, because we know what happens when people from different sides of history are brought together? We know what happens. We know that sometimes, you know, something emerges that may not even have been calculated in the sense of, you know, now we're planning for people to forgive. Something emerges because people approach each other, come together with a sense of openness. That openness is so important. But if we, if we, if we, if we have a, a goal, you know, we want people to forgive, we want people to reconcile, it ter I, I find it turns people off. In fact, this is in part why this language, you know, forgiving, reconciliation, has become, as I said at the beginning, a swear word, a kind of a swear word in my country, because people say, oh, reconciliation, the talk of reconciliation means we must all love one another. And our starting point should be that let's come together and listen to one another, to our experiences, even to the idea of, you know, listening to our fears. What is it that we fear most about encountering one another 
black, white, from different sides of history. What is it that we fear most? Even talking about the fear, even talking about the fact that, you know, my father was in the army and, you know, he was stationed in this place, or my uncle, or just by association. Even talking about those kinds of fear is very important. That has not happened in part because we use the words as words with a goal. Always the starting point is we want reconciliation, we want forgiveness. That is the starting point. And yet, <clears throat> the more we open the space up, you know, we have a dialogue like this, and people are touched in different ways because we bring our stories. Wherever we come from, there is this conversation happening here. We're carrying different stories, and we are touched and moved in different ways. The question then is, what do we do about it? That is the question. When people who came to the commission were moved and touched in a particular way, some of them said, I want to go and work with the HIV community to make a difference. My students, when I taught a class called master, uh, Master's Class Trauma in Context, where I brought visual images from the Truth Commission, from my own work, so that they can see what do we mean by traumatic pain? What do we mean by woundedness? <clears throat> what do we mean when people, you know, encounter each other? Students can see that. And you are, it's, it's, these are teachable moments. And what do teachable moments do? They touch you in a particular way, and they drive you to take action of a certain kind. That and so some of my students up to today from those moments of witnessing the pain of the other made a decision. My work is going to be in the communities where people suffer from AIDS or in the communities where young people are exposed to gang violence. You know, you get these kinds of, yeah, I'm sure many of you are teachers have encountered students whose lives are turned because of what they learn from the classroom. It's a moment where that defines their trajectory of life. It's the what do you do about it that is important and creating the space for that thinking, for that imagination to transcend the very sense of who you are so that you can act beyond the confines of what is normal to do the unthinkable and go to the township, go to that community that is considered an other. And what makes that possible is exposure and witnessing the story of the other. Oh, thank, thank you. Because yes. yes. I was thinking even more in terms of engaging people that we have in the communities, such as our spiritual leaders and other people like that, just to infuse the idea. Right. Mm. <laughs> okay, so are the microphones there? Can I please ask you, if you've spoken before, don't speak now. Oh, and okay. I would like to, no, because we, we really don't have much time. So there's a microphone there, if we start there, and then can someone take a mic, oh, you've got one there, and then the third one here. Okay, go. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Vela Maseko. I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm also a traditional healer. And I would like to, it's not necessarily a question, but I just want to comment on Usis Pumla has said, thank you very much for pinning down what Ubuntu is. I've been frustrated in the past two days, feeling that people are not getting the essence of what Ubuntu is. <laughs> uh, Ubuntu is not a concept, it is us human beings. It is our soul. <laughs> And this I have learned through my process of being initiated. I have come to discover that as a, what is termed umuntu is exactly, it's the soul. It's not the physical body. And therefore, the term we are one means we are one at that deeper level. 
We are the same soul and we, we live life in different bodies. And the essence of Ubuntu and empathy comes from that level. Hence, when you are sitting with the other person, you can feel their pain in your own body. You experience their world the way they experience it. At that moment, when you collapse the boundaries that separate us, when you transcend your physical body and you connect with that person in a, at a spiritual level, this is only they when you can feel what they feel. So my question is, for those who can, maybe the question from this um, <coughs> conference is, those who have lost that sense of connectedness, what has happened to that soul? And how can we heal that soul? That Thank has lost its sense. Okay. Can I ask you all to be a little bit quicker? Because otherwise we won't have a chance to respond. There's a mic at the back there. Um, morning, uh, my name is Ramu, and I'm interested in the link between Boto human rights and legal reform. Um, in my opinion, it seems that in the face of advocacy and legal reform, um, the response is usually to squash that, and sometimes with the use of traditional ideas. And the irony is that Boto actually promotes inclusiv inclusivity. Um, so. What I want to know is how do we flip that around um, such that we can actually use African principles to more to promote inclusivity and uh, diversity. Thank you. There's the person here. No, here. here. Uh, uh, thank you so much for evoking so many powerful feelings in me today. And like, I will not go into the details because she just said everything that I was feeling. But while I feel this great... Uh, upheaval right here in my unlikely um, area today. I want to address this to the scientists. I want to know, is there something that takes place in the brain? Or can something new be formed, new pathways or something, when such powerful feelings are evoked? When you hear this or you go through it. So if it's possible, is there something that can be done to train ourselves or to spread it among other people that <laughs> change can take place even at, I mean, not only at an emotional level, but at, in the brain. And then it can become like a way of life. So is there, do changes like that take place when such powerful uh, presentations or emotions are ev evoked in a positive manner? Negative I know happens. But I'm talking okay. about yeah. positive. <laughs> yes? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Last one. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Alice Mohwe, and I work here as a... I don't quite know how to describe myself. I do human rights work, so I was really happy to hear the question which was asked just now. Thank you very much, Mayor Pumla. You've really s stated what a lot of us have been wanting to say. Um, Boto is a way of being. It is not a thing which you learn in a textbook. It is a way of being. And as you said, the African languages should really be the way in which um, we try to express what it is. Motu, kimoto, kabato, which literally means a person is a person through other people. That is the literal interpretation, which goes back to the question of interconnectedness and the link of my humanity with yours. I've grappled with the concept which was put forward yesterday during the, I'll call it the scientific dialogue, yeah. um, relation to the in-group and out-group. I struggled with that because when we talk about that human connectedness, there is no out-group. We saw the Botswana flag this morning. Donald showed us how the flag itself is representative of what others might call the out-group and the in-group. The thick black stripe, and the two small whiter stripes. But for us, we don't have, in terms of the boto, which we know, um, outgroups. Strangers were welcomed into villages. Today, we see there are challenges with the laws relating to localization, exclusion, expatriates needing work permits, residence permits, etc. So that's a challenge for us in contemporary Botswana. Sharing, key part of boto. Sharing of food, even today, the Motswana will find it very difficult to sit down and eat a meal mm. in front of somebody else who has no food. Mm. So what we do traditionally is you say, mm. I'm eating. If I have an apple which I cannot share with somebody else, mm. and I'm the only one with an apple, 
I say gaja to those who are sitting with me and hoping that they'll say emma husiami. Yes, it's okay. You can go ahead and eat. Um, My sister, if I'm you going don't to stop you in a minute. Okay, I'm really sorry, but I'm saying in terms of bringing it to contemporary society, we see corruption, where that notion of sharing is really um, being assailed. In conclusion, I've just got so much I'd love to say, <laughs> which I think, again, for future dialogues, there should be more space for interaction, especially if we're talking Botu and interconnectedness. Um, but in conclusion, um, I'd like to say Botu is sustainable development. Botu is inclusivity. Mm. Botu is participation. Botu is respect of others and the dignity of everybody. And Botu goes beyond rights. It goes beyond the mm. international conception of rights. Botu is tong Botu, <coughs> the notion mm. of shame, how you feel that there's been a breaking of that connectedness. And the big challenge which we continue to have in the human rights space is the individualization yeah. of rights, mm. separating the individual from community, which is why the African Charter mm. talks about human and people's rights. And, and there's really this constant to struggle to try and ensure. I will stop there and thank you very, very much. Okay, thank you. Okay. So we only have a few minutes. There are a few questions. I'm just going to ask individual panel members. Not everybody does not have to speak, but if there are any of those questions that you would like to respond to and any that came to you specifically. So if we start with Becca, and does anyone else want to add anything? No. No, okay, let's start with Becca. I think, Puna, you had a couple that people might want to hear from you by, but... Um, so I just wanted to answer the question that was directed at the uh, scientists, is can we, um, can we train our brains to, uh, to change in response to positive things, like um, you know, forming connections with other people? And the answer is, is definitely yes. Um, if, you, uh, if you go on Google and you search for any newspaper headline that contains the phrase, changes your brain, there are dozens and dozens where you know, you'll find um, being a parent changes your brain, uh, Facebook changes your brain, mm -hmm. taking a walk in nature changes your brain. And so uh, one of the things that we know for, sh for certain is that every experience you have, whether it's positive or, ne or negative, can cause long-lasting changes in the, the connectivity within your brain. And so if you think about, um, you know, so I, I did talk about, you know, negative memories and how you can remember things that are, um, that are bad that happened to you for a very long time, even down to the little details. The same is true for positive memories. And one of the, um, the examples that neuroscientists like to use is, um, is your grandmother's house. So there are, there are smells and sights that I think evoke really powerful, um, often positive memories from, you know, from your childhood, right? So, you know, even if it was decades ago, there are very distinct associations and cues that remind you of positive things. And those things are, you know, are again, due to the um, strengthening of connections in your brain. And so absolutely, um, if you engage in uh, you know, mindfulness and, and Ubuntu and um, make it a point in your life to, uh, to think about the connections you have with other people. Absolutely, those are, those are things that on a neurobiological level can, uh, can last. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Did you want to add anything? Not really. Not really, okay. Oh, sorry, Mandaz. It's when we talk of dialogue, like she has been sharing with us. It's not only based on political issues that happened yesterday during the apartheid system. We need to engage dialogue in human society. Let us look at the relationship between you and your wife or you and your husband. Is that relationship in good order. If it is not, then we need to engage this kind of dialogue. <laughs> Look at the relationship between the parents and our children today. We always blame them to say they are no longer respecting elders. 
What are we doing about that? Mm. We need to engage this uh, dialogue of peacemaking. <laughs> so that is how we can go into our society and engage more of these reconciliations and healing. The first reconciliation dialogue was just an opening to other areas in human society. So again, <laughs> there is dialogue that you must engage with this you and the inner you too. Are you honest enough? Are you a man or a woman of your word? <coughs> if you are not, you need to engage dialogue. Are you honest enough at your workplace, as the manager of your business, with your employees. It's a lot of areas we are being asked to heal by spirit. It's not only based on the political issues, social issues. We also need to engage just my word of advice, to engage dialogue with our natural world. Are we doing justice when we pollute the waters of the world? Are we doing justice when we burn the forests and destroy all the communities you find in nature? So we need to engage dialogue with nature. We need to engage dialogue with our religions. There is a lot that needs to be done there. That's my little contribution. Thank you. Thank you. And then I'm going to just, oh, okay. Uri, 30 seconds. Lily, 30 seconds. Then I'm going to take 30 seconds to wrap up and hand over to Susan. Okay. Oh, Michael, I didn't see you. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, okay. I will, it's really briefly. Uh, I heard a voice from the young people in the audience yesterday and today on stage that we focus this meeting a lot about how we influence and shaped by other people, and they ask, but what about the I? And, and, and I think that we owe them an answer, and I will be very brief. I'm thinking that the I is something that you build over time. You're born into communities, you're born into villages, and you are shaped by them. But as you grow up, you meet many, many different communities. And your task is to improve your community, your dynamic in the world. And I think the eye is emerging when you become 20 to 30. This is where you're building your identity. And now when you become old like me, then you realize your path and how other people influenced you. And I think that now when you are in the process to shaping your eye, you are right. Each one of you is an individual that have a choice which dynamic you choose, whether you choose to be good or bad, helping other people or hurting other people, suppressing or building. So you are in the process now of building yourself. And you have to remember that you're building yourself based on the people you are interacted with and you choose to belong to. Michael? Thank you, Professor. I mean, you know I'm sympathetic to your work, especially on forgiveness, and this is just wonderful. I liked it, and I didn't need to make my statement is to say, I started my own presentation by claiming from my own reflection and encounter, lived experience that every encounter with the other person is a recreation of the self. This is how I started my own presentation. This is <coughs> my own lived experience, and I see it somehow linked to what Becky was saying that brain changes. So I see, every time I meet a person, even if I don't like that person, I become a new human being. I'm recreated. Mm. And so I, I made a claim, said, go have coffee with someone you don't like, like Donald Trump. <laughs> and some people said, what if Donald Trump is going to corrupt his own eye? And I said, my response to that is that um, spark of goodness <clears throat> Like the Bible said that uh, you put a small light in darkness, it will always shine. But if you br bring small darkness here, it will never be overshadowed by light, it will never overshadow light. 
And so when I'm someone I don't like, when I encounter him, it's always from my own experience that the good quality will always overshadow evil, no matter the situation is. And so I just want to say thank you because it just confirmed my own reflection that we encounter people, the different person, even their own vulnerability, that person I don't like is still a gift to my humanity. Mm. It's a part of who I am, you know, it still constitutes my own humanity. Without him, I'm nobody. So we create each other in that sense. We are like small gods of one another. And so this is what I think, from my own reflection and encounter, mm. what I'll conclude for Buddha for me. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Lily. Thank you. Um, for me, I'll just say, um, in conclusion, I'm assuming I, I can <clears throat> talk about anything that has... Okay, do okay. whatever you All right, <laughs> just trying to connect with what has gone on before and yeah. kind of looking forward to say where we are going. I think for me, one of the, the things that we need to hold very dear is um, how we treat knowledge or narratives. In this case, we've, we've had very important narratives that have been uh, shared with us here, which have led to healing and forgiveness. But sometimes knowledge can also be a negative thing in the manner in which we generate it or share it with other people. Because if it's not properly managed, it can actually destroy. Uh, and I'm thinking now, I'm just applying now to the whole uh, dialogue we've had that we should be very careful how we uh, ethically couch our questions because it starts there. If we don't have ethically couched questions for research, then the likely result is that that which we get afterwards is also not ethical. So uh, with that in mind, then I, I, I think I'll just like to say that we should be careful because then with that knowledge that is there, that is negative, we can reach dangerous conclusions and engage in dangerous acts. That's all I want to say. Thank you. And um, just before I call Susan up, I would just uh, like to start by reminding us a little bit of what we've been through. This has been two and a half days of discussion. We started with some really good framework, the, you know, Mpo Tutu's beautifully lyrical um, placing us in terms of Botho Mbutu and what it could mean, and the reverend here and his linkage with our spirituality. We've looked at spirituality, science, humanity, starting through the spirituality, having Michael ground us with the philosophical <coughs> concepts around Botho Ubuntu, responses from people like Jimpa to again link the spiritual aspects with some of our academic thinkages, Mandaza to root us in our traditions and ecology and environment, leading through to three really interesting scientific discussions around are there things about our mental processes, our physicality, that actually reflects um, Ubuntu as an ethos, Ubuntu or Boto as our being or in our acting, and moving on from that into actually looking at the millennials and they're coming in and talking about what they have learned and what they feel they are doing and how they uh, dream of taking that state of being, that concept of Ubuntu, that gift from Africa to the world, into the work they're doing now and into the future. And then being so gifted with Pumla, who could come and truly exemplify, truly talk about some of the traditions, what it means about the being, what it looks like in practice, what it feels like. And to leave us with that really important question of, what do you do about it? It's great to sit in conferences, and we should really thank Mind and Life because they gave us the opportunity to discuss something that, as Africans, mm. we know we should be discussing. <laughs> but as our young people told us, this will mean nothing if we do not do something about it. Mm. So Pumla's question, what do we do about it? I changed the U to we. <laughs> what do we do about it? I hope that's echoing in all of us. For the scientists and the academics here, which questions will you now be asking? How will they be 
change. Mm -hmm. For the practitioners, the activists among us, what does this mean when we're talking about the work we're trying to do to really put the spirit into our legal systems and into our practice. For the young people here, how do you shake up us oldies and make a change? So <laughs> I really hope that question will stay with us. And for all of you who have feedback, it's really important. This is a first. We need to do this more often and we need to make it better. We need to build on what we've done well and learn from what we haven't done well. So please fill out your evaluation forms mm -hmm. and hand them back. <laughs> and that really is serious. If we're going to improve, we need to know how to improve. And so as I ask Susan Barawu to come up to the stage to say thank, well, to round up everything. She's over there. I was thinking, where are you? Um, I would really like us all to thank our presenters. You guys have been wonderful. Would you like to see? Would you like to see? Thank you. So. We come to the official close of the conference and I just would like to share a few words with you. Wow. So at the start of this dialogue, I extended an invitation to you. And the invitation was to bring a sense of curiosity, of not knowing, receptivity to possibilities of what might unfold during this time together. And I can personally say that my eyes are wide open, my heart is full, and I have gotten way more out of this time together than I imagined was possible. So for all of you that have been here, that have participated, Thank you, thank you for being here. So this was indeed an unprecedented conference and in some ways it was an experiment. And it was an experiment in bringing more voices and perspectives into the mind and life conversation. And to be here in Africa and to share this dialogue not only with all of us here in this room but also worldwide through live stream technology. And I'm also really pleased to let you know that we've recorded this and we are creating a digital documentary that will be freely available to, um, to anyone, anywhere. And we also likely will be having a book um, on this as well that will um, document what we experienced here as best we can. So 30 years ago, the Mind and Life Dialogues began with intimate conversations with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And as a well-respected leader in Buddhism, His Holiness, instead of believing that Buddhism has the exclusive or higher truth, he believes, he deeply believes that every wisdom tradition we can learn from and hear from and be better as a result of one another. So over the last 30 years, Mind and Life has undertaken a lot of work that is really the confluence of spiritual wisdom traditions and Western science and philosophy and ethics. And ultimately, it's, we've been exploring for many years of understanding the mind and understanding the mind why, to then basically understand human behavior and be in service to humanity. And I believe that this time here in Botswana has been a very pivotal time in Mind and Life's history. And this is, has been a dialogue, and it's been a dialogue about spirituality, science, and humanity. And We've expanded the conversations. 
We've gone beyond East meets West to more fully include the voices and perspectives, those of our African sisters and brothers, deeply exploring the beautiful indigenous wisdom tradition of Botu, Ubuntu. Thank you. So through such dialogues, receptively, receptively sharing, deeply listening, and being with one another, being fully present with one another. Only then can we synthesize our different perspectives and wisdoms, and through that we can come up with effective solutions that are based on universal ethics, universal ethics, to confront the many challenges faced by humanity worldwide. And then we can create a more compassionate world and a more vibrant planet. This was a very special time together because we also included these different voices we went beyond the theoretical. We included the practical call to action and also the voices of the brilliant, beautiful young leaders. So while His Holiness the Dalai Lama wasn't able to be with us physically, I know he was here fully in spirit with us. And I know that he'd be really proud and very pleased for what we've been able to, to share together. And it's not only what we shared together, but it's what we co-created together. And I'm um, really grateful that he urged us to go forward with the conference. There was a point in time where we weren't quite sure how it would all unfold, and, um, and here we are. So, in closing, I just want to say a, a few thanks. Uh, again, a, a thank you to um, President Kama, the government of Botswana, <laughs> who has been really unwavering in their commitment and support of us being here and opening their doors fully. To the Matswana, the people here, wow, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, to uh, Boto University for freely welcoming us here. To all of the panelists, you have put so much into everything. Thank you. Pumla, one panelist I want to mention. I don't know if you all know, but it has taken a village to get Pumla here today. <laughs> there were many travel complications and she made it, and the tenacity Thank you for just bringing it all together. <laughs> and for the millennial panel, wow. I have to <laughs> you, you give us great hope for the future, and it's just so wonderful, so refreshing, and for you to know that including them this morning was sort of, we just, the, the hearts and the minds just came together in a beautiful, synergistic way, and so I really thank them for rising to the occasion. To um, our sponsors and donors, without them we would not be here. That is the only way we continue our work, so thank you. And um, the Awakening Arts Festival last night, wow, wow, thank you. 
We want to include the arts. And this afternoon, we're, right after lunch, we're going to be experiencing the arts and how Butu Ubuntu um, brings us to another space and being alive. And um, the, the arts help to, to nourish us in, in that way. To the many volunteers, many volunteers, and all the different vendors. Um, I want to give a special thank you to the security staff who I see outside, standing in the cold. <laughs> they have continued. Every person I look at just smiles and welcomes us. The AV team, you know they never get any credit. I'm going to give you some credit, guys. Thank you. <laughs> and the program planning committee, really the, the architects that have put together this incredible program and all the invitations. Stand up if you're on the program planning committee. Thank you. <laughs> well, everybody's standing. <laughs> And to the Mind and Life staff, those that are physically here, those that are back in Charlottesville, you guys are the best. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So this dialogue is just the start of the conversation. It's clearly not the end. And I look forward to continuing the conversations and the collaborations with all of you. I invite you to apply for grants and think tanks that we support. Um, we have special money set aside for international work. I expect we'll have money set aside for work here in Africa. And, um, and please come to other Mind and Life gatherings. Thank you for your presence and for all the goodness you bring to the world. Thank you. Thank you.